It is much more than a piece of glistening metal, this World Championship trophy. It is a holy grail, a shining carrot held just beyond most of baseball's determined grasp, left only for the strongest in the end. If you look closely, you can almost make out the images of the last group of Braves to hold it. Henry Aaron, Eddie Matthews, Lou Burdett with those three dramatic victories in the seven-game triumph over the Yankees in 1957. Surely they would rule forever, but the dynasty was short-lived, and nine years after that celebration, they moved south, changing first names to Atlanta. Their quest, however, would forever be the same. Aaron was the last holdover from that World Championship team of 57 when the Southern version got its first smell of the postseason. New names like Rico Cardi and Phil Necro helped the Braves win the new Western Division, only to lose in three straight to the Mets in the playoffs. It would be 13 seasons before they would get another chance, the years lean and futile in between. Their only glory an individual moment in the spring of 1974 when Aaron passed Babe Ruth on his way to immortality. Aaron in his earlier days used to hit more to right, right center than the left. Oh, there's a long drive. Balls hit deep, deep. It is good. He did it. He did it. Henry Aaron is the all-time home run leader now. But one of Aaron's old teammates, Joe Torre, began a renewal of the dream in 1982. Torrey managed the Braves to 13 straight victories to start that season. 1-0 pitch, Come on, hit center field! Come on in, here comes Butler! Here comes the throw! Safe, Braves win! Can you believe it? Saw them lose 19 out of 21 midway, only to hang on and win the division on the very last day. Again, new young faces seemed to predestine a long stretch of glory. Horner and Hubbard, Ramirez and Benedict, and of course the wonderful Dale Murphy, who would win his first of two straight MVP trophies. Well hit left center, Murphy on the move, still going, did he get it? Yes, great play. But like in 1969, their quest of the ultimate prize ended quickly. The Cardinals eliminating them in three straight games, and the long march began again. As they turned a decade's page, it was almost as though they turned eras, for slowly, quietly, the magic began to return. After finishing the 1990 season with the worst record in all of baseball, the Braves took 1991 by storm. The kid pitchers, Glavin, Smoltz, and Avery, the young everyday men, Justice, and Lemke, and Gant, all brought together by the leadership of Terry Pendleton. What a show they put on, night after night. There's a fly ball, deep right field! Back goes O'Neal, he's at the wall! Braves lead, Braves lead, Braves lead! They became the first team in history to go from worst to first, taking the Pirates for the National League Championship. The kick and the 0-2 pitch. Here's a bouncer to first, fielded by Hunter. He races to the bag, and the Atlanta Braves have won the National League Championship. Strap on your dancing shoes. We're headed for the big ball, Atlanta. Along came new October heroes. First and foremost, the delirious Atlanta fans who turned Atlanta Fulton County Stadium into the chop shop spurring their team to the edge of a world championship at last. Up three games to two over the Twins. Only to see Minnesota recover and win it all. Unlike years past, the foundation seemed firm now. The footing solid. This was a team prepared for greatness. A year later, they won the division again, and again faced the Pirates in the championship series. Atlanta fans thought they had seen tension and high drama in seasons past, but this would rewrite their definitions. It seemed like deja vu for a while. The rosters of both clubs so similar to the previous autumn. 
And like 1991, this one too went to the seventh and deciding game. But with one slight alteration. It was 2-0 Pittsburgh going to the bottom of the ninth and 2-1 when the fireworks began. Swung line drive. The celebration that took place in this clubhouse back on that October night in 1992 was unforgettable. But the year ended in disappointment. So did 1993 when a great pennant race against the Giants culminated in a playoff loss to the Phillies. That brings us to 1994. 94, the year a black cloud hung over baseball. That's right, Skip. As we all remember, in the middle of August of that year, the players went on strike, ending the season and the World Series. And as 1995 approached, the entire season was in doubt. But a court order enabled baseball to resume. And as the Braves reassembled in West Palm Beach in early April, they had one goal and one goal only on their minds to win the World Series. Because they knew that this year they had the talent to win it all. It's baseball time again. Let's play ball. If you believe in omens, the Atlanta Braves' 1995 regular season began with six of them in a row. On an opening day delayed nearly a month by the strike, the Braves attacked the Giants like a team overdue. In yeah, the left center field, that's going to get in the gap between Bonds and Lewis and roll to the wall. And Marquise Grissom debuts as a Brave with a double. Here's the 2-2, and there's a line drive center field in for a base hit. Marquise Grissom will get the red line applied at third. Runners first and third. Nobody out here in the bottom of the first. one nothing in Atlanta. The base hit to right field by Chipper Jones. That didn't take long. In the left center field, base hit for McGriff. Blouser rounds third. He will score. Chipper Jones heads for third. It's 2-0 Atlanta. Sharply hit into right field. Base hit. That'll get another run in. Chipper Jones crosses home. Down to second goes Fred McGriff. It's 3-0 as the first five Atlanta hitters have connected for base hits. Here's the 2-1. Into right field. Another base hit. Fred McGriff will be held up at third. The base is loaded. Six consecutive hits. No better way to win the fans back than to start out a first inning of opening day like this. Fred McGriff hit two home runs. David Justice won. And three-time defending Cy Young Award winner Greg Maddox cruised to a comfortable 12-5 victory. In fact, they won six of their first seven, staying comfortably in control for the first time ever in the realigned National League East. Sending a bit different lineup to the plate than what Braves fans had seen the season before. Marquise Grissom was acquired from Montreal during spring training, giving the Braves a very strong leadoff hitter and one of the best defensive center fielders in the game. See if the park will hold this one. Grissom at the wall. He leaps and he holds one in. Base hit. One run in. Two runs are going to try. Grissom's throw is in time. Right center field, Marquise Grissom on the run for this one and comes up with another one. Whoa. Ryan Klesko was up from the minors full time. Chipper Jones took over at third base for the departed Terry Pendleton. But it was a lineup that would take a while to gel. The Braves swept at home by the Phillies and while both their pitching and hitting were dominated by Philadelphia, the Braves' biggest concern was the health of David Justice. A shoulder injury took him out of the lineup for nearly a month. Could they survive without his bat? In fact, it was a team searching quietly for many answers. Too early in the season for panic, but knowing someone would have to step up soon. On June 5th, in a tight game with the Cubs, Bobby Cox turned to his bullpen and signaled for Mark Wohlers. It would turn out to be a momentous call. For Cox was giving the young fireballer another chance to become the club stopper. He had tried before and failed, but this time Wallers took the challenge, earning his first save of the season. Drilled left field, back goes Kelly to the wall. He's got it, and the ball game is over. 
Two days later, he became the first Brave in six years to strike out four men in one inning to earn his second save. Runner goes, the one-two pitch. He did it. Mark Rollers is in the record book. One inning of work, four strikeouts. There are many who believe a World Series Express left the station that week. Engineered by number 43. Rollers is a difference uh, in his team. First part of the year, uh, they were trying to find a closer, and we struggled uh, real bad playing under 500. They gave Rollers the job. Uh, he changed our whole season. Got it through the fastball right back. Coincidence or not, since Mark uh, has been doing what I think we all thought he could do around here, this team has taken off. And I mean, Mark's been awesome. get to the ninth, if you're going to beat us, you got to beat that 100 mile an hour heat. If you can do that, you deserve it. And uh, Mark Mark has a confidence now, and uh, he's definitely pitching, you know, with that confidence, and he's doing a great job for us. You might say Wolters helped the Braves catch fire, but fate nearly did that, literally. It's odd, their fixation with fire. The July night Fred McGriff arrived in Atlanta in 1993, a part of the Atlanta press box caught fire. The team followed, going from nine games out of first place at that point to the division championship. A red-hot trip to Montreal in mid-June of 1995 was another spark. Their team plane filled with smoke as they were about to leave Hartsfield International. Everyone was safely evacuated and another plane boarded. No doubt about it, they were five games behind the Phillies in third place at that time. They won seven of their next eight and began to turn their season around. Lavin delivers. Bouncing ball to short. Blouser goes to Lemke. One on the first double play. And Tom Glavin has pitched the Braves a gem here tonight. A six hit shutout. The third straight complete game by an Atlanta starting pitcher. One of the most remarkable eight day stretches in Braves history then shot them back into first place. Going from five games back to a tie for first. Winning eight out of ten games while the Phillies were falling apart. Chipper, driven high and deep to right field. Mondesi back, and this ball is out of here. The play win. They're in first place by themselves, and Chipper Joe just hit a three-run home. By the All-Star break, this team that had danced with mediocrity for nearly half a season suddenly could not be stopped. In the space of 19 games, they went from five back to five ahead and simply built on that. Everybody contributing, not only to wins, but theatrics. Line drive, right field, base hit, just as up, throw to the plate, hit, oh, that's a play, Braves win! A perfect throw by David Justice. Nobody in Atlanta either left the ballpark or went to bed early this season. How many times did you see it? going to have late inning magic again tonight. We'll soon see. Between first and second, I, I, I got a, a picture of my mother crying in the stands. Sure enough, I got home and dad said, man, she was bawling her eyes out. So it was one that I'll enjoy for a long time. Fastball driven to left field, and it's hooking away from Gilkey. He can't get it. Fred rounds third. He'll score easily. And Mike Mordecai, his only at bat of the night, and it's a beauty. Curve, hit hard, base hit. Here comes Mondesi. Here comes Grissom. Here's the throw. He is a Braves win. A great throw, but the speed of Grissom beat the ref. He hung a curveball. And McGriff came through, and the Braves win yet another thriller. Line drive, Braves win. the game by a final score.
score of two to one and a huge crowd is very happy. That's 19 times the Braves have won a game in their last at bat. Nice going, kid. What did you hit? Thank you. Well, he threw me a couple of fastball inside, and uh, I couldn't I couldn't get the bat quick enough to hit it. But as soon as I get to strike, I look for the slider. Uh, throw me the slider away. Finally, I got it. I don't even know that that was a strike, was it? Didn't you go get one out of the strike zone? Well, something away from me, because that way I can reach, uh, I can stand my arm and hit it with the top of the bat. And that's what I did. Here comes the 2-0 pitch to Mordecai. Line drive, right field, it's in for a base hit. Dwight Smith around third, the Braves have done it again. Mike Mordecai delivering the game-winning blow in the bottom of the ninth. 20 times this year, the Braves have won a game in their final at-bat. And there's a drive to center field. Back goes Carr to the wall. It is gone, home run. And on that 3-2 pitch that was up in his eyes, David Justice leveled off and blasted it. Boy, did he get up on top of that high fastball. That was pretty. Now, I don't, really don't know why I offered at that pitch because it was up, it would have been a ball, but I just reacted. Something told me to go after it and uh, my approach to it was perfect. I like to have that approach every at bat. Tell you what, you guys are amazing. Can we ever win a game in the second inning or the fourth inning or something? It's always, <laughs> seems like it's the last inning. Well, you know, we got to do something to keep the fans here for the full nine innings. Yeah, it's good for our so, ratings you know. too, buddy. Oh, <laughs> we, we appreciate that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Everyone played a role, but one slowly began to be singled out. Night in and night out, there was the youngster at third base. The former number one draft choice of the Braves, the kid who had spent the entire season a year before on the disabled list. Chipper Jones, just 23 years old, but suddenly playing like an old veteran. Three of his 23 home runs came in the ninth inning to win a game. Deep to right field. Swing of his bat, Chipper Jones has untied the game. It's 3-2 Atlanta. My dad always told me when I was growing up, there's there's somebody out there. If I wasn't uh, uh, playing or practicing baseball, there was somebody out there that was out working me. And uh, uh, I didn't want that to happen. I, I made it a goal of mine to my first year in the league to try and come out and win the Rookie of the Year, to uh, uh, make a significant contribution to, to this team. and, and uh, Hopefully, you know, we'll win a World Series and whatever comes after that, uh, icing on the cake. I feel that I'm a 300 hitter in this league and, and I fell well short of, of the, that expectation, but uh, certainly the 23 home runs and 86 RBIs were uh, a big surprise. Um, I think all Bobby asked of me, you know, before the season was to play steady defense and hit third and do the things it took to, to win ball games, and, and hopefully I've done that. By late August, the Braves had it in cruise control, ahead by 15 to 16 games and clearly preparing for the postseason. But never satisfied. It was as if they were a canvas in the hands of a Rembrandt, always touching up the edges, trying for perfection. It was nothing new. John Sherholtz has been touching up the Braves since they hired him as their vice president and general manager in 1990. That deal's done. Pendleton, Belliard, Bream, Nixon, McGriff, Sanders, Pena. The list of Sherholtz imports seems endless. And in 1995, he dealt with the White Sox for Mike Devereaux with the Yankees for Luis Polonia and reacquired Alejandro Pena from the Marlins. All made an impact, but none, not one, any more than the remarkable Greg Maddox. The first major league pitcher since Walter Johnson in 1918 and 1919 to put together back-to-back -to -back seasons of less than a 1.80 earned run average. The first National League right-hander to lead the league in complete games for three consecutive years since Grover Cleveland Alexander. Simply, well, got it. What a job. He is the best, folks. He is the best. Well, just what is the best? Is it four straight Cy Young Awards? What is the best? Is it being the first pitcher since Sandy Koufax in the 60s to lead the National League in earned run average for three straight years or more? What is the best? 
Is it his 18 straight victories on the road? What exactly is the best? His teammates know. Awesome, unbelievable, I mean, dominating. You know, he's so darn good that, uh, you know, he can make the best lineups look bad. I guess you could say he defines the uh, definition for a pitcher. Before I got over here, uh, obviously I'd, I'd seen him on, on TV and I, you know, I, I know he, he was a great pitcher, but to see him in person, to play behind him is totally unbelievable. Anybody would love to have a Greg Maddox and certainly that's a huge plus for any club and that is one of the differences, you know, on our club. We have Greg Maddox. He's going to win the Cy Young four years in a row. Nobody's ever done that before and we own him. The postseason was a given for the Braves from mid-August. They simply didn't know who or where. With realignment and a wild card and an extra playoff series put into effect, they, like the rest of baseball, waited for it all to be spelled out for them. In fact, they celebrated clinching the division title in midair, flying from Colorado to Cincinnati in the wee hours of September 14th, the first team to win four straight division titles in National League history. On the opening day of the National League playoffs, most of the world's attention was on a courtroom in Los Angeles. x x read all about it. O.J. goes free, 35 cents, x x The Braves, meanwhile, were a mile high as they began their march to the championship. There in the shadows of the Rocky Mountains where the Blake Street Bombers had terrorized National League pitching all season long. The Braves and the three-year-old Colorado Rockies at a brand new Coors Field. Programs took on line of Rockies first. Home playoff game. The atmosphere electric as the crowds gathered for this new best of five opening round. The Braves sent their 19 game winner Greg Maddox to war in game one, leading a roster of playoff veterans and wide eyed youngsters. And who should lead them to victory in that opener but one of the latter, Chipper Jones, with a stunning defensive play at third base. Another one of those ones you just you don't know how you do it. Uh, you just kind of push your shoulders back and say, yeah, I did that. And the game-winning home run in the ninth inning. That look of awe now simply awesome. Fast ball swung on. High fly ball, deep right field. Back goes Kingery on the track at the wall. That ball is gone! A home run for Chipper Jones! He hit it in the Rockies' bullpen, and the Braves are back on top. Five to four. I hit the ball out of the park to, to give us that one run lead and, and probably the biggest game of the year. So uh, I was just basically floating on air, going around the base. I looked back in the dugout and everybody was just really excited and, and happy. And you know, it just thrills me that, that I could provide for them. A chilly rain kept both teams inside leading up to game two. But when the skies cleared, it was Tom Glavin's turn to make the Colorado fans nervous. And once again, one of the youngsters led the Braves to victory. Mike Mordecai, who had won two games during the regular season in their last at bat, did it again. I'm not a household name, and you know, it wouldn't bother me if I never was. Uh, but uh, I would love to be a world champion, and uh, I'm going to do what it takes to, to help our team win a world series. And, uh, you know, I don't think if, uh, if the coaching staff and John Sherholtz and organization didn't believe in me, I wouldn't be here. So that's what it's all about. Mordecai beat uh, Darren Holmes uh, right here a couple months ago on a 2-0 pitch down the right field line. So we know who Mordecai is. And now it was on to Atlanta, the Braves' home. Their fans confident despite facing a murderer's row led by the man they call the Big Cat. Andres Galarraga. It was his heroics in game three that cut Atlanta's lead in half and gave the Rockies newfound bravado. I always feel that until it's until it's over, it's not over. And uh, the fat lady may be warming up to sing, but uh, she's not out there yet. But in game four, the fat lady was up almost before the national anthem was over and singing the praises of Fred McGriff. He gave starter Greg Maddox all the support he would need with two home runs and six RBIs. And for the first time in two autumns, the Braves could truly celebrate. This time, their feet were planted on a locker room floor, filling quickly with water, champagne, and shaving cream. This is just a first step in the, in the long road to the World Series, but it's a positive one and something for us to build on uh, going into the, the Red Series. We know that's going to be a great series. Well, the Reds are they're a very good team. They have very good speed. They have power. They play excellent defense. They have good pitching, but so do we. <laughs> we do, too. So uh, uh, I think it's great. I think the two best teams are going to be facing one another, and uh, I think that's great for the game. I think that's the way it should be. 
Two days later, with the champagne and shaving cream properly rinsed away, it was back to business. The Braves on to Cincinnati for the first two games of the National League Championship Series. A bridge, perhaps, to another World Series. But a bridge crossed limping. In the euphoria of the victory over Colorado, pain. David Justice had injured a knee during the final game and spent the days preceding the Red Series testing it. Could he play? Would the bulky knee brace hold up? It would, and so would he. But his health would be a concern right up to the very end. The Reds were coming off a blowout sweep of the Dodgers and seemed almost cocky, bolstered by several national publications that picked them to beat the Braves in five or six games. The Braves, on the other hand, went about their business as they had all season, quietly, confidently. Game one was a tight one and went to extra innings. Two and one, McGriff at second, pitch. Fastball, lined in the center field, base hit. McGriff's gonna be way at home. Darren Lewis up with it. Here comes the throw, it's off the mark and McGriff scores. Braves lead it, two to one. And it was Atlanta's defense that finished this one off. Five double plays in the opener, including one in the 11th with Reds at first and third. That was how Greg McMichaels spelled relief. In double plays, the pitcher's best friend, so we got him at times we need to get him and got us out of some jams. And uh, the last inning, it was, uh, couldn't ask for a better time for double play. One thing that always gets overlooked is our defense, but I mean, we get that ball on the ground with guys on, those guys can turn it. No one in the league can turn it better than Mark Lemke. And, uh, you know, he just came through tonight all night long. Our defense was amazing. They've been amazing all year, but it's, uh, it's one thing that seems to get always overlooked with our big bats and our starting pitcher. If the Riverboat Gamblers expected an easier time for the Reds in game two, they saw their odds dwindle in another nail biter. It was 2-2 in the 10th when Reds reliever Mark Portugal wild pitched home what turned out to be the winning run. Javi Lopez then broke it open with a three-run homer, and the Braves had swept the first two games on the road. Uh, when Javi hit that home run, it was such a boost that, uh, you know, for them it's a good thing they got a day off, but nobody here, we're, you can see the clubhouse, nobody here realizes that this thing's over by any means, but we feel like our chances have improved vastly. Just because we're up 2-0, by no means do we feel that this, this series is over. And, and, and I like to use the phrase that uh, some pitchers say around here, that the next start is their most important one, regardless whether it's April or October. Especially coming home to Atlanta, up 2-0 and turning their fate over to their ace, Greg Maddox. The Reds, meanwhile, turned to David Wells, the third straight left-hander they would start against the Braves. They had retooled themselves by acquiring Wells to give them a predominantly left-handed rotation, specifically to face these Braves. That backfired again in the sixth, when a right-handed batter, Charlie O'Brien, belted a three-run homer to put the Braves on their way to another victory. It was enough to reduce the Reds to near tears. Yeah, I mean, it was... Uh, you know, what are you going to do? You, you try to... Uh sneak by but you just we're not doing it our backs are at the wall not you know against the wall it's definitely at the wall you know, hopefully we'll come out tomorrow and uh, be able to score some runs early uh, which we haven't been able to do um, and stay on top the whole game the Braves were in the driver's seat now, and the man at the wheel was Steve Avery. So troubled during much of 1995, winning just seven of his 20 decisions, but so strong in the last three starts to earn a role in the postseason. All was not perfect. David Justice once again was hobbled, this time by a batting practice shot from teammate Javi Lopez. The knees swollen and uncomfortable, but destiny seemed at work. Mike Devereaux started in right in Justice's place in game four. Avery was brilliant, justifying his call and setting the stage for Devereaux's heroics. The wind and the pitch, and there's a drive. He looks up. That ball is gone. A three-run homer for Devereaux. It's 5-0 Atlanta. This, unlike so many of the others, was a blowout. For once, allowing the clubhouse plenty of time to be properly prepared for a party. Here we go. Reggie waits. The 0-2 pitch. Here it is. The Braves are National League champions. They struck him out. Listen to this crowd. I'm 
a rookie all over again. I mean, everybody's been there but me, it seems like, on this team. And uh, I'm excited. I guess I'll have to hang out with Chipper. <laughs> you know, we went out, we played well. I think Chipper had to our pitchers, and it's just a wonderful feeling. Those feelings you can't replace during the regular season. You know, it's going to take me a little bit of time to absorb everything that's going on here. But uh, I know that uh, I know we have another hurdle to go over. And, uh, you know, this is just part of it. This is what we wanted. We wanted the opportunity to get back to the World Series and, and atone for the past problems that we've had. And now we're here. And now we need to take advantage of it. You know, we want to win. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And, um, you know, it's been our goal all along is to get back and win. The dramatic and unexpected four-game elimination of the Reds delivered the Braves a dozen positives, a week of rest, a week to prepare their pitching rotation, a week to sow, and paint. and put their house in order for another World Series. A week to get David just as healthy as much as anything. A week to find out if Jeff Blauser could possibly play. He could not, as it turned out, and was left off the series roster, replaced at shortstop by Rafael Belliard. And by midweek, time to prepare mentally for the daunting task of facing what had become baseball's most fearsome hitting lineup, the Cleveland Indians with baseball's highest team batting average in over a half century. The storyline would be the bottom line. Atlanta's overwhelming pitching staff against that awesome Cleveland lineup. But one small sidebar and a key perhaps to the first two games was that the Indians put their numbers together all season with a designated hitter. In the opening games in Atlanta, their pitchers had to swing a bat of their own. After a week's wait, the day finally arrived for Atlanta fans. For the third time in five years, they were going to the World Series and there couldn't be sweeter music to any baseball fan's ears. Game one in a dressed up Atlanta Fulton County Stadium. And if there were signs of nerves, nobody saw them. Fred McGriff, in fact, facing his very first pitch ever in a World Series, promptly blasted it for a home run to tie the game. But perhaps nerves did play a part. Bases loaded with Braves in the seventh. Game still tied at one. It was funny, but I was feeling nervous for the first time in, in my whole career. You know, I never had that feeling. And uh, maybe because it was such a key situation that uh, I just couldn't believe it. I got to get off the bat one time and, and just try to, you know, put my, my legs really tight because it was shaking a little bit. I go like, what is wrong with you? I mean, you got how many thousands of bets you have already and you already worrying about one at bat. You know, just go out there, try to make contact and let things happen. Polonia hits into the perfect double play, but the gold glove shortstop Omar Vizcael bobbles it on the way to second. But the call is out. Bobby Cox argues long and loud, but to no avail. It was on his way back to the dugout, Cox said later, that he decided to call for the next play. Watch out for the squeeze play here. Pitch on the way to Belliard. Squeeze is on. Here comes Justice. He scores. It's 3-1 Atlanta. Good call, Don. And that was all Greg Maddox would need as he dazzled the Indians with a two-hitter, and the Braves take the opener 3-2. I mean, it's great to win the first game, but... Uh we got to win three more. I mean, it's just it's just a very small step to where we actually want to be. And uh, you know, we may have won the battle, but we're not even close to winning the war. And I think we all understand that. Uh, it's a very good team, and just need to come out and play well tomorrow. That's what's amazing, going out there and, and, and throwing this kind of game and getting us off on the right foot, which is so very very important. The Atlanta fans rang the turnstiles and the cash registers again for game two. Two veterans facing each other, Tom Glavin against the 40-year-old Dennis Martinez. And the Indians would strike quickly for the second straight night. Eddie Murray's two-run homer set the tone. But on this night, the hero would be Javi Lopez. The one-two pitch to Lopez. Another sidearm pitch driven deep to center field. Back goes Loft and away. Back that ball is gone! He would win this game not just with his bat, but with his arm. 
And in the end, with Braves fans begging, Mark Wohlers did what he had done all season, and the Braves were up two games to none. I mean, what can I say? This is a World Series. This is my first time in the World Series. And just not only to hit a home run in the, in the World Series, but uh, to win the game because of that home run, that's something that you can never forget. That's something that you always got to... You always, I always gonna remind this, this day, that day, and that's something that I have to be very, I have to feel very proud of it. When you get into the World Series, man, I mean, it just seems like everything is resting on when men are in scoring position, and uh, you know, it's who can get the big hit. You know, what I mean, who can make the great defensive play. It was a very relaxed, almost mellow Braves club that took its lead now to Cleveland for the middle three games. Not a care in the world, it would seem, and much of that has to do with Bill Acree, the veteran director of team travel and equipment, an unsung hero on his way to a championship goal as well. As the club got its first look at Jacobs Field in Cleveland, the big story was not about game three, but of a night later. Bobby Cox deciding not to come back with Greg Maddox, but once again showing confidence by starting Steve Avery. For the first time in 41 years, Cleveland was hosting a World Series and the city strutted its stuff. It was bitterly cold and windy for game three with wind chills in the upper 20s. The Indians took a big early lead. The Braves overtook them in the eighth, only to lose the game in the 11th on Eddie Murray's heroics. One on and hit into center field. Here comes Espinosa. Grissom's throw is high. Cleveland Indians win it 7-6. There will be a game five. Game four was slightly warmer, slightly wetter early on. Perfect weather for the Michigander Steve Avery, who seems to thrive on the postseason. David Justice, whose bat had been silent through the first three games, hit an 0-2 pitch for the key base hit in this one. Curveball line in the right center field. Here comes Polonia. Here comes Chipper Jones. David Justice, some clutch hitting. 4-1 lead for the Braves. Pedro Borbon Jr. came on to close it out. And the Braves were within one win of their first world championship in Atlanta. When I got in there, it was just me and Javier Lopez. I just saw the Met, and I didn't see nobody else but I, I just the Met and Javi. It's just an exciting time knowing that uh, you're just one small step away. I really don't think that they're going to quit. Uh, I wouldn't mind if they did, but <laughs> I just don't see it happening. We're only human, and we know we're closer to being world champions. Uh, we just haven't put the final touches on it yet, but we, we can taste it. Um, it's just up to us to go out there and do the job. Slowly, subtly, they were changing from their business suits into party garb. As they left their Cleveland hotel for the last time, they silently wondered, would this be the night? After all, they had Greg Maddox rested and going, the perfect scenario. But from the first inning on, it was evident this would not be his night. Albert Bell's home run to the off field in the first inning was a very obvious tale. That it ended only in a one run loss was a testimony to the young left fielder Ryan Klesko, whose ninth inning homer was his third in three games. I think it just gave us a, give us a chance to, uh, to clinch in front of our home fans, and we, of course we'd like to cl close it out as early as we can, but we got, we got a chance to go home now. And it's advantage playing at home, we got Glavin throwing and we're ready to go. They came home in the wee hours of the morning to be greeted by a thousand cheering fans at the airport. So unlike the Atlanta fans who had been so quiet through much of the run, almost expecting a championship. There's more people here than there was in 91, so it's darn nice. It was that side of the issue that greeted the city upon awakening Saturday morning. David Justice begging for the noise of 91 and 92, the excitement that seemed to carry them to greater heights. The headline said he ripped them, and he was left to explain himself in the hours leading up to game six. Outside, the hospitality tents seemed to beckon the greater party to come. Would this finally, finally be the night this team and this city had been awaiting for 30 years? Simply, yes. Come on, Tommy! 
Tom Glavin was near perfect, shutting down the vaunted Indian attack with just one hit. And who should lift this enormous crowd out of its collective seat as one? The 1-1 pitch. Fastball, swung on and belted. Deep right field. Back goes Ramirez. That ball is gone. Home run. This crowd on its feet for David Justice right now. But because this was a one to nothing game and could turn on the swing of any bat, the tension remained thick and the scramble to prepare the clubhouse for its ultimate celebration came late. It came down to this and how perfect. Mark Wohlers and there could be no better relief than this. The wind and the pitch, here it is. Swung, fly ball deep left center, Grissom on the run, yes! people who publicly told the world what their mission was on the first day of spring training never wavered we're never going to be shortchanged we're never going to take second place uh, they had to win this and they told the world that without fearing any kind of pressure and it resulted in this they accomplished their mission we've won more games than anybody in baseball the last five years and this is a proud uh, a proud uh, crown to a, a glorious five-year period for us and these guys in here all deserve it especially our manager Bobby Cox who has been the finest manager in baseball for the last five years and gotten very little recognition. He deserves it more than anybody. Well, it's a long time coming, but I've been very, very proud of the organization and this club. You know, for five years now, we've been a winning baseball team, but I guess to be defined as a winning baseball team, you have to win the World Series, and, you know, we did that this year. They were very, very determined all through spring training, all through the season. They, wasn't, they were not going to let anything stand in their way. You know, this is something that we've been dreaming about uh, since we've been little kids. Something that this uh, group of guys has been dreaming about since we lost uh, the World Series in 91 in Minnesota. And, you know, you got to give credit to the guys in that clubhouse and the people in this organization. We didn't let that get us down. Uh, we didn't let the 92 repeat loss of a World Series get us down. We kept plugging away and kept focused on the fact that we needed to get back here and sooner or later we were going to win this thing and here we are and it's, and it's the culmination of a lot of hard work. When you look at the success of this ball club, you got to look at it from top to bottom. Each and every guy on this ball club can look in the mirror and say at some point in this season, he's played a part in our success and that's always a great feeling. You've been here seven years like myself and they're trying to put you out of it. You get a, get a ring out of it, something you can rock on your chair for years and years and that ring will always look good. And I got one of the best owners to try to get me a beautiful ring. We have a great feeling. I think everybody play hard, you know, and we do it for the fame. We did it for the fame, man. They great fame. We love it. 24 guys pick up the other guy that isn't doing a job, and then hopefully he'll come back around and pick somebody else up. And fortunately for me, I was throwing my best in the ball of the year at the end of the year when it really counted. You know, I had my postseasons in the past, and we didn't win a World Series. And I wasn't at my best this year, but it don't mean a hill of beans because we won a World Series. So uh, they can say all they want now about who's a postseason player and who isn't. We got a world championship under our belt. This is a dream year. I, I mean, I can never forget that year. Uh, at least I can say that uh, I've been in the first world champion of Lanza Brave. This is the first championship they got. And I feel glad that I'm be part of it. A lot of veterans go through a whole career without getting this. Does this feel unfair that a guy in his first year gets one like you? I don't care if it's unfair or not. I'm not giving it back. I mean, you know, we're going to have a great time trying to defend this thing next year uh, because the only thing that would be sweeter than this would be doing it again next October. Hopefully first of a uh, number of world championships that we'll win. 
I like it, and I think the players do too. Everybody likes it. From the grounds crew to the general manager, did a fabulous job, and uh, you know, it takes lots and lots of people uh, to make a successful organization in anything. And um, you know, I'm looking forward to the parade on Monday. I, I need to, you know, sleep on it tonight and read the papers in the morning and make sure it's, it's like a dream, Connie. You know, like waking up in the middle of a dream. So Peachtree finally paraded its first world champion. The team of the 90s finally, halfway through the decade, measured up. The chalice was theirs at last. On behalf of all the people of Atlanta who love what you've done, your grit, your tenacity, and your style, we give this proclamation and we proclaim today Braves World Champions Day in the city of Atlanta. There you go. Atlanta is a dynamic city. Atlanta is a proud city. Now, Atlanta is a world championship city. Enjoy. The Atlanta Brave of the World Champions. Yeah. Now.